So next we've got something which is slightly out of sequence um, and there's a reason for that, which is that it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit into Dickens's kind of trajectory. And the reason for that is it was a bit of a failure. It's really cheering to think that not even Dickens got everything right. <laughs> Um, that he too had his kind of clunkers and his howlers. Uh, Master Humphrey's Clock was a weekly periodical which was designed to be a sort of catch-all for um, stories and sketches and the kind of thing he'd had so much success with earlier in his career. Um, the clock itself was supposed to be a kind of physical receptacle where um, papers were stored and the idea was that every week you would reach in and discover a paper which you would then uh, print. Um, the reason that it's interesting though is that this is where Dickens started to publish uh, two of his weirdest early novels, one of which was Barnaby Rudge, which was his attempt at a historical novel about the Gordon Riots. Um, the other one is The Old Curiosity Shop, uh, which includes uh, the famous or infamous Death of Little Nell. That took on such a kind of momentum in culture. It became such a huge popular success that it kind of outgrew its original kind of publication source in Master Humphrey's Clock and became a sort of self-sustaining uh, novel. But, but this is where it started. Um, and pretty soon after he finished uh, Barnaby Raj, he also finished with Master Humphrey's Clock mm -hmm. and only came back to this idea of um, publishing uh, within uh, his own journals later on when he founded, um, first of all, Household Words, and then later uh, All the Year Round. So next we have a novel which, um, it's an extraordinary step change really in Dickens's career. This is Bleak House. He published it or started publishing it, I should say, just after the Great Exhibition, uh, where the world had flocked to the Crystal Palace uh, to marvel at um, exhibition and uh, uh, manufacture and all the things that were supposed to be driving on the British Empire. Um, Dickens didn't like the Great Exhibition. He didn't like the Crystal Palace. Uh, and he also thought that what the world needed, he said, was a dark exhibition mm -hmm. to show the shadowy side of British culture. And what he ended up producing was Bleak House. Um, and Bleak House isn't only a story about the hidden connections between the rich and the poor and the, uh, the foreign and the domestic. Uh, it's also something which tries to capture that idea of the hidden darkness at the heart of British culture, not only in its uh, stories. We can see here on the, uh, the title page, Joe the Crossing Sweeper, who is um, one of the many neglected poor, uh, who is swept himself into the cracks of civilization and just ignored by other people. We also see the start of what a uh, uh, fizz uh, called the dark plates. The dark plates were a new kind of um, illustration, a new kind of technique, which involved much heavier cross hatching on the metal plate itself to give the illusion of something which was um, shadier, darker, uh, had more depth. So what you've got here then is um, the whole uh, reading experience uh, being something which is more three-dimensional, more realistic, uh, more, well, darker mm -hmm. as Dickens matures uh, and starts to realise that the, the cheerful sunlit world of the Pickwick Papers, which begins with the sun rising, mm -hmm. actually perhaps might not be appropriate uh, for a slightly later period, which is indeed darker. So here we have David Copperfield, um, Dickens' most autobiographical novel. It even includes a fragment of autobiography that he embeds into it, uh, which deals with his own childhood experiences mm. of working basically as a sort of wage slave uh, in a shoe polish factory. 
um, when he was much younger. Um, and you see that actually in this title page where David Copperfield by Charles Dickens, even the initials mirror each other, don't they? D, C, C, D. Um, and that is then carried on through the novel itself, where we get lots of distorted or refracted versions of Dickens himself. So at various points we meet um, a mad second-hand clothes dealer called Charlie. There is a flute-playing schoolteacher, also called Charlie. Um, there is another character called Mr Dick, <laughs> who is writing a memorial of Charles I, who keeps losing his head, mm -hmm. and so on and so on. Um, so even though he never wrote a full autobiography, in some ways this is a kind of fictionalised uh, memoir um, in disguise. Um, again, we see his uh, move into much higher social circles. The Honourable Mr and Mrs Richard Watson are the, uh, the, uh, the posh friends that he um, dedicated this to. We also see here the fact that um, something about the way that Dickens himself used to write. So uh, I mentioned earlier that um, sometimes he would use a mirror, um, but he also thought of his fictional characters as if they were like children. They were like real people. There, there's a lovely story that um, uh, he tells himself, I think, in, in a letter about not being able to um, stop writing because he felt that the characters were kind of yanking on his kind of jacket kind <laughs> of sleeve. Um, as if when he closed uh, his, his writing at the end of the day, he was kind of shutting up his kind of surrogate family um, before going back to, to his real family. Um, and he, he sort of alludes to that in the preface to David Copperfield, where he says that um, when he lays down his pen, when he finishes this book, this is how an author feels as if he were dismissing some portion of himself into the shadowy world when a crowd of the creatures of his brain are going from him forever. Um, if you wanted a, 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 an illustration of that, a kind of picture version of that, then there is a rather brilliant unfinished watercolour uh, called Dickens's Dream that's currently in the, the Dickens Museum in London. And what that shows is Dickens dozing by his desk in a chair, while a crowd of his own fictional characters kind of float around his head. Some of them are in colour, some are in black and white, some are barely sketched out in pencil. And it suggests him uh, dreaming up or dreaming again of all these characters who uh, were of course only two-dimensional, made out of paper and ink, but for a lot of his readers gave the illusion of being as real or uh, of, uh, as much flesh and blood as you and me. Dombey and Son, uh, not one of my favourites and I think mm -hmm. not one of many modern readers' favourites, but a really interesting novel, I think. Partly because again you can see on this uh, title page illustration just how messy and complex the plot is going to be the number of characters, the range of activities uh, that's going on there. Also interesting that now on this title page, we see that we've got his signature, Charles Dickens, rather than just the print, Charles Dickens. Um, and it's evidence of how Dickens by now had become a kind of recognisable brand, uh, or uh, what was sometimes called at the time a public character. He was recognisable. You could buy photographs. Uh, of him um, in the street. You could buy illustrations of him. Um, people who went to the Great Exhibition in the Crystal Palace could see a version of Dickens, even if Dickens himself wasn't there because he didn't like it much. Um, so Dombey and Son is more evidence of how successful he was becoming, but also how much he still wanted to retain that sense of intimacy uh, with his readers, that sense of him being their, their friend rather than just a public entertainer. So the preface here um, uh, talks about um, uh, how he wants to say farewell to his readers 
in this greeting place and says, I have only to acknowledge the unbounded warmth and earnestness of their sympathy in every stage of the journey we have just concluded. So again, in the nicest way possible, kind of sucking up to them, getting them on side, making them feel as if they were collaborators in this fiction rather than just passive consumers of it. Um, but we also see, as well as that, we see uh, more evidence of how he is trying to preserve the style that made him successful in the first place. Um, again, he's describing London, as he often does. And again, he is trying to capture two versions of London at the same time. There is the ground level confusion of what it is to be someone just walking around the city, not knowing who is who, what is what, and where to go next. And when we read those kind of complex, um, overburdened sentences of his, sometimes we also feel as if we don't quite know where we're going. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there is a narrator who clearly does know where he's going, who has, if not omniscience, then has a kind of bird's eye view of the city and all its inhabitants and is leading us by the hand and showing us where to go and what to see. And we can switch focuses then very, very quickly from the grand level of confusion to that sense of kind of uh, overview. And that means that we then can imagine what it's like to be these characters and at the same time realize that we're in the hands of someone who is completely in charge. So we move on to A Tale of Two Cities now. And um, we haven't said much about his publishers so far, but of course their information is on the front page of every one of these books. Chapman and Hall, um, uh, who were based in Piccadilly, were his long-running, long-suffering publishers until he had a fit of peak and dumped them and went off with uh, someone else. Um, the reason I mention it is that Dickens often signed contracts then often treated those contracts as if they were just first drafts, <laughs> which could be kind of revised uh, whenever he kind of felt the need. So, um, but they made money out of him uh, and he made money out of them. So it was a kind of marriage of convenience, but like a lot of marriages, there was often a lot of squabbling and <laughs> sulking that went along inside it. Um, the other thing we notice here though is it says, um, and at the office of all the year round. So this was Dickens's second uh, main uh, magazine, which he founded and edited all the year round. And it's where A Tale of Two Cities first started to appear before it was gathered together uh, in, a, in, a, in a single volume. So this is a story about the French Revolution. So clearly it's a story that looks backwards. But in some ways it's also looking backwards to Dickens' own life, because... <coughs> He, um, we've already spoken about um, David Copperfield as carrying on with lots of strange refracted images of Dickens himself. This too has uh, a hero, anti-hero, uh, called Sidney Carlton. Uh, originally he was going to be called Dick Carlton. Mm -hmm. um, and the person who is his lookalike is Charles Darney. So Charles Darney, Dick Carton, C, D, D, C. Again, it's two people who look the same and as if their initials, again, are, are looking in the mirror. Um, as if that, that way of writing in which Dickens sometimes goes to the mirror conducts himself in this kind of grotesque way and then goes and writes down what he sees. As if somehow that's starting to inform not just um, his melodramatic style, uh, but even the characters and the plots that he comes up with as well. So we now move on to the final completed novel by Dickens, Our Mutual Friend. Um, this is fascinating in all sorts of ways. Perhaps the most interesting thing might be that it shows Dickens' uh, desire, again, to try and knit his writing together into complete uh, fictional holes towards the end of his, his career. Um, so um, there's one of his prefaces in which he talks about the storyteller at his loom, as if he's weaving things together into some kind of big design. Um, 
And he also starts to introduce little tags for some of his characters, kind of comic kind of things they say whenever they appear, like Barkus is willing, <laughs> a character says in David Copperfield. Again, reminding readers from episode to episode, instalment to instalment, who these people are, what they represent. But increasingly, he also starts to um, produce a kind of symbolism, whether it's uh, prisons in a novel like uh, Little Dorrit, uh, or uh, here we've got the dust heaps and we've got the river in Our Mutual Friend. Again, as if this is a way in which he can somehow link everything together so it becomes fully and tightly bound uh, narratively as well as physically bound uh, as a book. Interestingly, though, a lot of critics think he didn't succeed, that they see the symbolism as just sort of bolted on extras. Um, George Orwell uh, puts it really nicely. He said that Dickens, uh, as a writer, uh, produces dreadful architecture but wonderful gargoyles. <laughs> as if you know, what we want with Dickens is not the kind of tight organisation of a novel by someone like George Eliot. Uh, what we want is the kind of the, the freewheeling, um, sort of picaresque, um, unexpected connections. Um, and that, I think, is probably where a novel like Our Mutual Friend is where it is its best. Finally, in terms of his fiction, we have the mystery of Edwin Drood. Now, I think the most interesting thing about this book is not the title page, but what's opposite it. Here we have um, an illustration of Dickens, which is the Dickens we're all familiar with. Yes, this is the Dickens with a baggy face, prematurely lined and aged, thinning hair, a grizzled beard. Um, his own signature underneath it. So this is how, this is where Dickens arrives. This, this is uh, the final image of his career, which we think of as something that stretches across his old career. And The Mystery of Edwin Drood is a deeply weird book in all sorts of ways. One of which is that although it's a murder mystery, and therefore it should be a story about who done it, it's now become a rather different kind of mystery, which is how Dickens would have done it, you know, how, how he would have finished it, how he would have completed this story. Uh, and it's been subject to endless continuations <coughs> and supplements. Lots of people have tried to solve uh, the mystery of the mystery, um, but, but nobody really knows. Um, what we do know is that he died in the middle of writing it, and that produced its own mysteries, like where was he when he died? Was he at home, mm. which was the official line? Was he with his mistress, mm -hmm. Ellen Ternan? And the body had to be kind of manhandled into a coach and brought back home to Gad's Hill Place. Was he taken ill at his mistress's house and then finally dragged home, finally to die? So a novelist who was obsessed with uh, his image, and with control, everything had to be controlled, right at the last, uh, lost control. So as well as Dickens' own fiction, he also enjoyed collaborating on uh, other works. Um, although, like a lot of his life, like his amateur theatricals, he liked collaborating as long as he was firmly in charge. And this is a really good example. The Christmas Numbers, of all the year round, were published annually at Christmas, of course. And what they involved were almost like um, sort of fictional chain letters in which he would start off a story and then it would be passed on to another writer, mm -hmm. like Elizabeth Gaskell, for instance, uh, who would write the next bit and then someone else would write the next bit. Um, so what readers got then was a kind of... Um, family of storytellers gathering together around the family hearth at Christmas to tell ghost stories. And again, it's going back to where he started his career with the Pickwick Papers and everyone feeling they were involved in this club, in this extended surrogate family. Here, you've got something which, as a physical object, could be bought and put at the heart of the family. 
And if you look at the back of this volume, you see um, an advert for British corn flour to be used in making custards and blancmange and baked <laughs> pudding uh, and so on. Um, all of which suggests that Dickens's writing uh, wasn't only imaginatively exciting for readers, they were also, of course, objects. They were physical things. Um, and they were often bound up with adverts for other physical things. And sometimes those physical things uh, made their way into the fiction itself. So in um, Nicholas Nickleby, there's a moment where the Nickleby's mad next door neighbour um, uh, makes a reference uh, to Roland's Calidor. So does she bathe in Calidor for nothing? I think Calidor, Calidor. Oh, Calidor. And you turn to the front and you realise there's an advert there for Calidor, which is an all-purpose beauty preparation, like a kind of beauty cream. So it's almost like um, modern product placement in a, in a Hollywood <laughs> film. Yes, you, you, you've got um, a manufacturer who is giving you money to advertise in the wrappers around your monthly instalment. And then you turn to the instalment itself, and there you've got a reference to the, the product uh, itself. So you know, it, it's, just, it's just another example of how Dickens isn't only a, a writer of fiction for Victorian readers, he's sort of bound up with, physically bound up with, um, their everyday lives.